All right, uh, welcome to class, everybody. So today is really exciting because we're going to start talking about partial differential equations, uh, which is probably the most um, useful topic that you're going to learn in 564, 565. Uh, so partial differential equations are really the backbone of how we describe uh, most physical systems of interest, okay? And so we're going to learn a few important things over the next maybe four to five weeks. Um, so we're going to learn how to take a physical system that we're interested in and write down a model in terms of a partial differential equation. So we're going to learn to build PDEs to describe systems that we're interested in. We're going to learn techniques to find solutions to those PDEs, so solutions to our system in space and time. Uh, and we're also going to learn how to interpret those solutions. Okay, so really important stuff. Uh, and I thought I would just give a couple of motivating YouTube examples because this is um, one of the things I like about partial differential equations is that um, one of the things I like about partial differential equations is that you can get really, really cool uh, movies out of them and great visualizations because the entire idea is that your partial differential equation is describing how some quantity of interest like temperature or fluid velocity or position evolves both in space and in time. Okay, and so that spatial temporal relationship basically means great movies. Uh, so this is a movie of um, flow past a sphere. This is the solution to the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is flow past a dimpled golf ball. And so you can see um, the difference in the top and the bottom. Does anyone know right off the top of their head what's the main difference in the top and the bottom? Smooth sphere, dimpled golf ball. Okay, say that again. Okay, so the separation point is farther forward on the dimpled ball. That's true. What are the implications for this system? Huh? Okay, less drag. And the way you can see this is if I if I play this movie, you see that there's this kind of region, this wake region of disturbance, and in the smooth cylinder, it oscillates in these big coherent vortical patterns, and it has a large, broad wake, which means it has quite a lot of drag, whereas in the bottom flow, uh, the dimples both cause the separation point to be farther, and they trip the system to turbulence, and so you have a kind of more constricted, more spatially compact wake region, which is lower drag. Um, so this dimpled ball will travel much farther than the smooth ball. My uh, turbulence professor, the person who taught me um, most of what I know about turbulence, actually consulted for the uh, like one of the world golf tour associations on how many dimples a golf ball should have. So he's part of the reason that golf ball dimples are nearly optimal, um, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so that's one example. This is the solution of a very nonlinear, uh, pretty nasty partial differential equation called the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, anytime you get in an airplane, anytime you throw a football, or you know almost anything, you can think about fluid flows that are causing the forces, the drags, the moments, the lifts, um, and it all comes back to the solutions of this partial differential equation. So writing down the partial differential equation, I didn't tell you what it is. We need to figure out what is the equation we're solving. We need to figure out how to solve it. And then we need to figure out how to interpret the solutions that we get. Okay, so here I'm just showing you the solution to an equation. I never told you what it is. Okay, this is another one of my favorite examples. This is an example from quantum mechanics. So this is the double slit experiment, but visualized as the solution to a partial differential equation. Some crazy stuff is happening back there. So quantum mechanics, optics, um, 
you know, fiber optic lasers, satellite communications, all of these kind of electromagnetic um, quantum phenomena are solutions of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Very similar to the Navier-Stokes equation, actually. If you write down their 1D approximations, they're actually the same. Weird. Um, so anyway, um, there's lots of PDEs in material science. So if you want to look at elastic waves through a solid, if you want to look at the electromagnetic properties of a material, of a piece of glass or plastic um, or crystal, then you're essentially talking about Schrodinger's equation, which is, again, a nasty nonlinear PDE for wave propagation. OK? Um, so I'm going to go through great lengths to explain lots of physical, interesting examples of PDEs throughout the next four or five weeks. Um, but to start, I want you to just get familiar with what is the form of a partial differential equation, what are the pieces, what are the language of how we talk about these things. Um, and then starting in the next lecture on Wednesday, we're going to take a physical system, which is the heat uh, conduction in a rod, and we're going to actually just work it all out. Okay, so we'll work out a physical system. We'll start with the physics. We'll derive the partial differential equations. We'll solve the partial differential equations, and then we'll analyze our solution. So that's what we'll do on Friday. Um, okay, so today... We're talking about partial differential equations. And one of the things I like about this is that it really synthesizes almost every concept that we've learned in class so far. We're going to be using complex variables. We're going to be using vector calculus to write our PDEs. We're going to be thinking about the solutions of these partial differential equations in terms of the ordinary differential equations, which we're very familiar with at this point. Um, and this is also going to motivate things that we haven't learned yet, like Fourier analysis, Laplace transforms, and some of the methods from data science. OK? OK, so basically the difference between a partial differential equation and an ordinary differential equation is simple. Ordinary differential equations have one independent variable, and you take derivatives with respect to that variable. So a PDE is essentially an equation relating a multi-valued function and various partial derivatives of that function. So a PDE is an equation relating um, a multivariate function let's call this function u and its partial derivatives. OK, this is just a definition. So PDE is a re an equation relating some function u, which is multivariate, multi not multivalued, has multiple variables it depends on, and various partial derivatives of u. Okay, so for example, um, we might have our function u be a function of space and time. And um, maybe this u is a temperature. Okay, so what I could have... Um, I could have a circular rod of metal, and I could have some temperature distribution on this. Maybe I've been hitting this end with a blowtorch for the last five minutes, and this end has been dunked in ice. And so I have some temperature distribution on this rod, and I let it go. And I want to know what is the temperature distribution at all points in space for all future times t. Okay, So this function u which is a function of space and time, is the thing I want to know. I want to know what this temperature distribution is in space and time. Okay? And so an example PDE would be something like um, the heat equation. And the heat equation is 
you know, partial u, partial t equals some constant times partial u, uh, partial x squared, second derivative in space. Okay, so this is a heat equation. Um, I didn't tell you why this is true for heat conduction on a rod. We'll have to go down to basic physics to figure out why this is the relationship that describes heat conduction in a rod. That's what we're going to do on, on Friday. But the basic idea is that I have this partial differential equation. And this partial differential equation relates partial derivatives of the function I care about, u. Okay, so u is this temperature distribution. It has a temperature at every point x and at every time t. And I can take its partial with respect to time. I can take its partial with respect to space. And I can relate them in this partial differential equation. Any questions at this point? Make sense? I have some function I care about, u. And I'm, you know, I have some, essentially this codes up the physics of the situation in some relationship between partial, dif partial derivatives. And the solution of this PDE is the function u. So the function I care about is the solution. u is the solution. of my PDE. OK, this is not, um, I'm not trying to like take a big step here. Let's just think about what an ODE would look like. So a good example of an ODE is like the bunny population. I have something like x dot equals a times, maybe I'll say p for population. My population dot equals some constant c times my current bunny population. This is basically the same kind of equation, except that my bunny population p is just a function of time. So p of t is my bunny population. And so there's no partial derivatives. This is just the derivative of my bunny population in time is some constant times my bunny population. So the only difference between a PDE and an ODE is that the function you're trying to solve for in a PDE is more complicated. It has more dependencies. It has dependencies, for example, on space and time rather than just on time. Okay. So for example, if I wanted to build a model, and I did this once. This is the first computer program I ever wrote. Let's say you want to build a model for the bunny population in a field a really large field, like a field the size of Kansas. So you could grid this thing up so that you have one square kilometer squares, or maybe 10 or 100 square kilometer grid points. And I could have a population that depends on x and y and on t. OK? So I could have my bunny population now depending on which location I'm in and on the time of my simulation. Okay. So if I have a spatial equation where each of these boxes now has some local dynamics, maybe bunnies really like to stay where they were born and they like to grow, then I might have some spatial dynamics of bunny populations. Maybe they'll eat all of the resources over here and move to this square. Maybe they'll eat all the resources here and move to this square, eat all the resources here and move to this square. And so you can take some modified bunny equation, some modified bunny ODE, and you can write that down for every single grid cell. And you can actually have coupling between them. Maybe bunnies move. Maybe once they grow up, they move one square over. Uh, maybe they move to where the most food is. So they diffuse to where there's a higher concentration of food. So this would represent kind of a pictorial partial differential equation that we could cook up to represent spatial population dynamics. And these are actually really, really popular. So you don't just do this for bunnies. You also do this for people, right? We want to know where people will go um, to look for jobs um, or to look for food, where fish go in the ocean. Um, so that's an example of how we take our simple ODE 
and we can turn it into a PDE by writing it down at every single grid point. I'm going to talk a lot more about this example way later in the class. This is how we're going to simulate these kinds of partial differential equations. We're going to box them up and write them as a bunch of ODEs. Okay. Okay, one last thing. I'm going to use subscripts to denote partials. So, uh, like partial, partial x. So if I have u sub x, that's defined as partial u, partial x. Okay, it's the x derivative of my function u. u sub t is partial u, partial t. Is everyone okay with that notation? Yep. Okay, good. So what I want to do is write down the three most important differential equations that we're going to solve in this class. We're probably going to spend about a week on each of these major PDEs. They're really important because, one, they're simple enough we can solve them. So they're good models for systems, even if they're kind of simplistic. Um, two, they describe some of the most useful physical systems, like vibrating strings or vibrating membranes, um, thermal transport, fluid transport, things like that. Okay? So I want to write down the three canonical PDEs. Okay, anyone have a guess at what one of these canonical PDEs would be? What are some important partial differential equations that you want to solve? Yeah, Stokes. Okay, Navier Stokes. That one's way complicated, and it's built out of these canonical PDEs. So that's why we're going to use these, because we can actually understand these as building blocks for things like Navier Stokes. What's another uh, simpler example? Heat diffusion. Okay, so I like heat diffusion, so I'm going to call that the second equation, the heat equation. Okay, what's another one? The wave equation is a good one, which I think is my first one. Wave equation. What's an example of an equation we've already come across in, for example, complex analysis and in um, vector calculus? Laplace's equation. And Laplace's equation is a lot like the heat equation, as we'll see. And you can kind of, the heat equation is like a fancier version of the Laplace equation. Okay, so the wave equation, I'm just going to write this down, and then we're going to talk about what all of the terms mean. So the wave equation is UTT equals some constant squared partial squared u. Remember, this is the um, partial squared is the Laplacian operator. It's like del squared, so sum of second derivatives. Uh, the heat equation is ut equals some positive constant times the same thing, the Laplacian of u. And the Laplace's equation, it's just getting simpler and simpler, right? Second partial derivative in u equals this. First partial derivative of u equals basically the same thing. And now for Laplace's equation, we have 0 equals our Laplacian operator in u. Okay, so I'm going to go through and actually tell you what u means and what, why we get all of these equations and what the terms mean in a minute. Um, so let me just write this down in 1D. This is the general vector form. So this is the general vector form. Let me write down, you know, in, in 1D. Okay, so that we really understand what this is actually saying. So in 1D, what is the Laplacian of my function u? Partial squared u partial x squared, right? So it's u tt equals some positive constant uxx. The second partial derivative with respect to time of my function 
is equal to some positive number times the second partial derivative of my function with respect to x. And the reason we care about the wave equation is because it can model things like vibrating strings or membranes or drums or anything that vibrates. So your earbuds are based on the wave equation. OK, so let's say I have some taut string. And I pluck the string, or I put some wave on the string by varying my boundary conditions. So now I have some, some displacement on my string. Then this height, y, is equal to my function u of x and t. So the thing I care about is I want to know how is the string going to move if I pluck it or if I do something to it. This equation tells me how this function u evolves in time and space. Now, I haven't told you why this is the equation for a wave. We have to derive that from physics. We have to actually think about what are the forces acting on the string. And this is essentially just a statement of f equals ma. But we'll come to that later. Um, so what does this string do if I grab it from the middle and I pull down and I let go? Goes up and down, and how does it go up and down? Sinusoidally. Okay, so I would imagine that some combination of sine waves might be the solution of this equation. So u of x and t might be something like sine of x times some other sine of, you know, t. Right? There might be sine, some frequency in x and some frequency in t that this thing is doing. Because this thing is actually going to look like a sine wave in x, or maybe a cosine wave in x. And it's also going to be moving up and down, also sinusoidally in time. So I, I'm thinking that this is going to be sines and cosines in space and in time. Okay, and we know that that's what's, what's happening. Uh, so probably on Monday, we'll actually work this example out, and we'll derive the Fourier expansion, because the sums of signs are also solutions. Because I can have superposition. Okay, uh, I don't want to give too much away too early. Uh, let's say about the heat equation. So what is this equation in 1D? UT doesn't change. And... Okay, my constant times uxx, right, in 1D. Now, these seem very, very similar, right? They're almost exactly the same, except that this one has a first partial derivative in time on the left, and this one has a second partial derivative in time. It seems like a small difference, but it's actually a huge difference. Um, they're entirely different classes of partial differential equations with wildly different solutions. So the top one is called a hyperbolic PDE, and the bottom one is called a parabolic PDE. Not that that name means anything right now. I just want you to know what things are called. And this parabolic PDE, so this system is going to have sines and cosines as the solutions, right? They're going to oscillate in time and in space. Let's think about a heat equation. So I told you this is the heat equation. And so now we have a very, very thin circular rod of steel. And let's say that I have a blowtorch. And I just give this thing an impulsive temperature at time 0 at that location. So my temperature is flat, 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 really hot, and then flat. What is this temperature going to do in time? OK, it's going to distribute outwards. In what way is it going to distribute outwards? What's a, what's a good word for how it's going to do that? Yeah, A little louder? A Gaussian. OK, so it's going to spread out as a Gaussian. What else is it going to do? What does heat do when it's localized in one place and then it spreads to another place? Diffuse. Diffuses. OK, so we have diffusion of heat, which means that at time maybe one second, I have a sharp Gaussian. And at time 10 seconds, I have a flatter Gaussian. 
at a time a bajillion seconds. I'm assuming that this is an insulated rod. At time a bajillion seconds, it's just a constant, slightly higher constant temperature. Okay, so this is Gaussian diffusion. Doesn't look at all like sines and cosines. This is sines and cosines. Yes? I'm saying it is insulated. Yeah, so somehow I just impulsively heat it in one location, but I'm kind of holding the whole thing insulated afterwards so that it keeps, it retains all of its added thermal energy. Okay, so this tiny, tiny difference, one partial derivative in time later, I go from having a solution which is purely oscillatory sines and cosines to having a solution which is Gaussian diffusion. Okay, now I'm going to teach you how to solve these systems by hand. And a dirty secret is that you're not going to solve a lot of partial differential equations by hand in the real world, in real life. You will occasionally. It's good to know how to do them. It's good to know the general techniques to solve these. But what I really care about far more than any of the mathematical details is I want you to understand why these equations look the way they do and what it means physically in terms of the solution. Okay, I want 10, 20 years from now you to know that a wave equation looks like this and has these kinds of solutions, and a heat equation looks like this and has these kinds of solutions. That's what matters. Okay? Okay, and then Laplace's equation is a little funny, um, so I'm not going to write it in 1D, I'm going to write it in 2D, 2D for Laplace. Right, because Laplace doesn't have any time dependence, so there's no notion of time in this equation at all. It's just spatial derivatives. So what is the what is the Laplacian in two spatial variables, x and y? Partial squared u partial x squared plus partial u partial y squared equals zero. And I'm going to write this in the same notation up here. This is just uxx plus uyy equals zero. That's Laplace's equations in two variables. What's kind of cool about this is that Laplace's equation looks a lot like the heat equation if ut equals zero. Right? My heat equation in 2D is ut equals alpha squared uxx plus uyy. Right? So if, if my time derivative of u is 0, then I recover Laplace's equation. What does that mean physically? What does it mean for my time derivative of u to be 0 in the heat equation? Steady heat distribution. It means there's no thermal transport. There's no heat flux anywhere. The temperature distribution is steady. And when does that happen? <coughs> well, it happens when all of these diffusions balance out to zero. That's when it happens. Okay, so it happens when Laplace's equation is solved. So, for example, the infinite time solution of this Gaussian diffusion is a solution of Laplace's equation. You can verify that a constant in space and time solves this equation. Okay? So, these are the three canonical partial differential equations. We're going to use these as examples and building blocks for all of the PDEs that we're going to learn in this class and all of the methods that we can actually use to solve things by hand come from these basic building blocks. Okay, that's not to say that there are not other important PDEs, but these are kind of especially important. And in every case, we care about solving for u, our function of interest, either our temperature distribution or our displacement of the string in space and in time. Okay, any questions um, before we kind of move on to some more technical details? Well, I've got any more questions about this. This is the building blocks of all of physical reality. Nothing? No?
Okay. So, what are some of the properties of these partial differential equations? Um, when I when you look at these PDEs, how do you tell them apart? What are the distinguishing characteristics of these PDEs that tell them apart from other PDEs? Sorry? Okay, the order. What does the order refer to? So uh, the first one is like the second order in time, and the second one is first order in time, and the third one doesn't depend on time. Okay, second order in time, first order in time, no order in time, no time dependence. And second order in space, second order in space, second order in space. So these are all second order spatial partial differential equations, and they have differing orders in time. Good, okay. Um, what's another property of these PDEs? What were the classifications in ODEs? What were, what were some of the main classifications we had for ordinary differential equations? Linear or nonlinear? So are these linear or nonlinear ODE PDEs? Okay, let me start writing this down. This is important. So these are linear, second order. So usually when you talk about order, you're just talking about the highest order. So even though this one's first order in time, it's second order in space, so it's a second order equation. And what's the last, what's another property of ODEs uh, that was really important to distinguish? What kinds of ODEs were easier to solve all assuming they were linear. What did you say? Anyone? Homogeneous. homogeneous versus inhomogeneous. So what does that mean again? Is there a forcing function or not? So do these things have an additional forcing term? External forcing. Okay, so these are uh, homogeneous. Okay. Inhomogeneous would be if I had like a plus F you know, where I'm externally forcing. So in this problem, if I had this blowtorch and I started moving it around, that would be an inhomogeneous PDE, and I would need to add something to this equation. Okay? So these are linear, second order, homogeneous PDEs. Okay, great. So the order doesn't really matter that much. I can solve fourth order PDEs, tenth order PDEs, it doesn't matter. They're all basically the same techniques. Um, homogeneous versus inhomogeneous, it's very, very, very similar to the case of ODEs, and we'll talk about that later. Um, you essentially have your principal solution plus your particular solution. But the difference between linear and nonlinear makes a huge difference, just like it did in ODEs. So in ODEs, an equation being linear versus nonlinear was the difference between us being able to solve it and not, right? And that's also true here. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you now about what it means for a partial differential equation to be linear and why that's so important. Okay? And I also want to show you what the hallmarks of linear versus nonlinear PDEs are so you know when it's something you can solve or when it's something that's going to be really, really difficult. Okay, so linear PDEs are built using linear operators. And I'm going to call these linear operators L. So just a poll. How many of you have worked with PDEs before in a class? How many have not? OK. And how many of you have seen linear operators before, defined or used at some point in life? How many have not? Okay, um, so the nice thing about linear operators are that they're pretty simple and intuitive, and they really make a lot of the notions that we're going to talk about very precise and easy to work with. So a linear operator, I'm going to give you examples of linear operators first, and then I'm going to tell you what they mean. So two examples are multiplication by a number, multiplication by a constant. And a second example is you know, taking the partial derivative. 
So I'm going to call this first linear operator um, L1 of my function u. So linear operators operate on functions. u is the solution to my PD. It's the thing I care about. So L1 of u might be 5 times u. That's a linear operator. Or partial derivative. I might have a second linear operator, which is partial u, partial x. Okay. So what does it mean to be linear? Well, first of all, I can compose these functions. So I could say, what is L1 of L2 of u? Well, what's L2 of u? Partial, partial x. So what's L1 of L2 of u? Five times partial, partial x of u. OK? So I can build up expressions by taking, um, by taking compositions of these linear operators. OK? Um, a third really important one is addition, probably the most important one. And I left it out of my notes. Seems silly. So addition is really important. So L3 of u. Um, would be like so this is actually called bilinearity and there's a reason I left it out of my notes, because it's confusing. So we'll talk about this one later. Um, but addition of functions is basically also linear. OK, so what does it mean to be linear? What it means to be linear is, so L is a linear operator if and only if um, L of the sum of two functions I'm going to erase this bilinear operator because it's just confusing right now. OK, so L is a linear operator if and only if. So u1 plus u2 is also a function, right? And I can apply my linear operator to this new function. And if what I get out is the same as L of my first function plus L of my second function, then it's a linear operator. L is a linear operator. Another thing that has to be true is that L of some number times u has to be that number times L of u. So this is for any number. And this is for all functions u1 and u2. So linear basically means what we think it means. Things add up. Like if I take the linear function of u1 plus u2, it's just the linear function of u1 plus the linear function of u2. And we can pretty easily verify that these two things are, in fact, linear. So let's just do it for uh, L1. So what's L1 of u1 plus u2? It's five times this thing which is u1 plus u2. And because of the distributive property of like real numbers, you get 5u1 plus 5u2, which does, in fact, equal my linear function of u1 plus my linear function of u2. Okay, So this property, property A, is satisfied for this linear function. It doesn't even matter what u1 and u2 are. I didn't, I didn't have to use any property or any special knowledge of what u1 or u2 are. That's true for all functions. Um, and you can verify property B the same way. It's super easy. Let's try L2 of u1 plus u2. So what is my second linear operator on u1 plus u2? Partial, partial x applied to my new function u1 plus u2. 
Now, if I actually wrote down the limit definition of this derivative on this function, you would find that you could split it up into two limit, limits with respect to x going to 0 of u1 and of u2. And you can show that this actually splits up into partial u1, partial x, plus partial u2, partial x. Try this out for a function. Like, try this out for x squared plus sine of x. Right? We know that the derivative of x squared plus sine of x is the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of sine of x. Right? This is something we've all known for a long time. And that equals L2 of my first function plus L2 of my second function. Okay. Any questions about this linearity? OK. So these are linear because they're built up in terms of partial derivatives. You can verify that the second partial derivative of a function is linear. And I would like you to do that. You should definitely verify that you know, the second partial derivative, any combination of second partials, partial with respect to x and y, still a linear uh, linear operator. So these are linear equations because they're written in terms of linear operators on you. Okay, um, let me give you an example of something that's a little weird that is not exactly linear, but it's quite, it's close, it's quasi-linear or um, affine linear. So a good example is um, addition by a constant. Okay. So what about linear operator three, which is addition by a constant? So L three of u equals u plus seven. Is this a linear operator? Okay, why not, or why so? You should be able to put L1 inside of L2 and get the same thing. So how you did on the left side of the board, right? If you switch those up and said this is L2. Okay, this is a really interesting point I had not thought about, but. For linear operators, these should be commutative. That's not always true, actually. That's not always true. Um, no, because if I have a matrix A, that's a linear operator. And if I have a matrix B, that's a linear operator. But A times B does not always equal B times A. It's only for special matrices A and B that that's true. But it's a really good idea, and it is true for this example. It's true for scalar linear operators. Okay, but it's not true in general for vector linear operators. Um, that's a really good idea. Um, so the basic thing we're going to try to check is that L3, our third linear operator of U1 plus U2, should equal that linear operator on U1 plus that linear operator on U2. So this equals U1 plus U2 plus 7, right? But that does not equal u1 plus 7 plus u2 plus 7, which would be what I need, right? That would be L3. Like what we need is for this to equal the linear operator on u1 plus the linear operator on u2, and it's not because I would get an extra 7. Okay, so this is not a linear operator because it's 7 shy of being a linear operator. But it's called an affine linear operator. And it has a lot of the same properties as linear for lots of applications. But that's all I'm going to mention about affine linear. OK, so what I want to do in the last five minutes of class are I told you about what makes an operator linear. We know that our three canonical examples, the wave equation, the heat equation, and Laplace's equation, are all linear. And so now I think I should tell you about what nonlinear functions look like. 
and how to spot them. Okay? So we have lots and lots of great tools to understand linear PDEs, just like we can understand linear ODEs and solve them by hand. But nonlinear PDEs are very hard to solve. Almost none of them can be solved by hand. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, most of the physical systems of interest are nonlinear. It's a lot of what makes things interesting, is that they're nonlinear. So some examples of nonlinearity. OK, so we know what linear are. What are some examples of nonlinearity? So what are some examples of n of u that are nonlinear? Well, what did you say? Product of two derivatives, yes. Um, cosines, yes. Simpler. Powers, u squared. u squared is definitely nonlinear. u cubed is nonlinear. u to the fourth is nonlinear. So let's try this. Let's try n of u1 plus u2. I get u1 plus u2 squared is u1 squared plus u2 squared plus 2u1, u2. This part is n of u1 plus n of u2 plus all this extra stuff, these extra terms make it so that this is not linear. It does not satisfy the first property of being linear. Good. Okay, you can also do that for cosines. The way I think about cosines is that they're a power series of powers, which are each nonlinear. Um, logarithms, exponentials, also nonlinear. Um, products are a really good one. So let's say that I have n of u equals u times ux. This is a really popular, common one. I'm going to take u times its partial with respect to x, just a product, any products. So these are powers, and any products are also nonlinear. And you can think of u squared as basically the product of u and u. So u and ux is probably also going to be nonlinear. Um, I'll let you verify this one, but it's basically the same idea. If you plug u1 plus u2 into here, you get the thing you need plus a bunch of extra cross terms that make it so it's not linear. Um, absolute value is a good example of a nonlinear function. So if n of u equals absolute value of u, that's nonlinear. Really simple example is like, let's say I have n of 5 minus 7. What's n of 5 minus 7? Positive 2, right? Okay, what's n of 5 plus n of minus 7? 12. Okay, so that one's nonlinear too. Um, I really want to write down a good example of a nonlinear equation, but I probably won't have time to explain anything about it. So a really important example is called the Berger's equation. How many of you have heard of Berger's equation? It's the tasty equation. Berger's equation is the partial in time plus u times ux, this nonlinear linearity here, equals some number nu times uxx. Okay? So what we have here is diffusion. Ut equals, if I got rid of this middle part, it would look like the heat equation. If I got rid of this part, it would look like a nonlinear convection. So this is my nonlinear convection term. And this is a really important model for how shock waves form in physical systems. Okay, so this is the toy problem that we use to understand shock waves, like in uh, hypersonic vehicles or rockets or um, shock tubes or anything. This is the example. So this term, this nonlinear term, forms shock waves. And this viscous term spreads the shock waves out. And we're going to talk a lot more about this example. Um, I could write it in vector form, and I'll do that later. All right, I'll see you all on Friday.